Well, this is interesting because there's something called the Dunning-Kruger curve, which Dunning and Kruger got the Nobel Prize for in 2000. In the curve, I'll have to draw it back to front for the camera, but it sort of runs like this. And this axis is confidence. Yes. And that axis is competence. Yes. So this whole curve is to demonstrate unskilled and unaware of it. Yes. And that peak they called Mount Stupid. So it's a group of people who are very confident, yeah, yeah, yeah. but don't really know what they're doing. The expert is right down here, low down on the curve because they realize what can go wrong. So that is a big thing. Ladies and gentlemen, we have finally come to our last podcast of season four. And uh, this is all about the cherry on the cake. It's really been an amazing season. I've been able to interview some incredible people, but I'm so excited for today because in today's episode, we're going to be interviewing somebody who for the last couple of years, I've been following and wanting to make an interview with her. And finally, I have the chance of having Dr. Isolde Heydrich on the show. Isolde, thank you so much for today. Oh, Cameron, thank you. I um, feel blessed and a bit intimidated that I should be on this show amongst all these world-famous rhinoplasty surgeons, but thank you. Oh, no ways. You can definitely keep your own on this. So, so Isolde, this is a listen to like 90 countries around the world. There's all sorts of people. There's both patients, there's physicians, there's surgeons, all sorts of people that listen. Just tell the listeners, who are you? How did you, I'm so interested in your journey, how you ended up where you're at. We're sitting in Cape Town at the moment, and we're going to be seeing each other in a few months' time at the World Rhinoplasty Week, which you and Dario are going to be involved in. I'm so excited for that. But just tell us, who are you? Where did you end up? You know, Dario, if I must do it in a sentence, yeah. I normally tell people I'm a musician who also studied medicine. Wow. Because I did music before I did medicine. Wow. But um, after qualifying um, my MBCHB, I first did um, my diploma in anesthetics, mm -hmm. and then I did work in cardiology, and then I did a um, harness in nuclear medicine, and then I went to study in dermatology. Wow. And uh, my last year um, of studying dermatology, I won a prize um, to our World Congress in Vancouver, mm -hmm. and this Congress had a pre-Congress workshop on treatment of the aging face. This was way back longer than I'd like to tell you. Okay. Um, and I was intrigued because nothing was really spoken about it here yet. Yeah, yeah. And I got there and I saw all these people who'd been treated and nothing was moving. And I thought, never in my life will I do this to or with anybody. Okay. Not for me. And I came back and shortly after that, um, somebody called Kunde Buller a Belgian dermatologist was brought out by a company to um, demonstrate certain techniques and they asked me to introduce him and we forged a friendship. And when I saw the respectful way academically in which he was doing things, I thought, well, maybe I could do this. But there was nobody here to ask, nobody mm -hmm. to teach me. So mm -hmm. I went by own relation to Belgium and spent time with him and started doing a little bit of um, toxins and a little bit of fillers. Yeah. But I was frustrated because yeah. back in those days, it was the Wild West. Everybody was doing what they thought, how they thought. Yeah, yeah. And for me, um, method and structure has always been extremely important. Yes. So I was not sure whether I wanted to do this. And then in 20, 2009, Ian Smith and I started the Cosmetic Dermatology Center, our clinic, which we have today. Yes. And I had to make a decision whether I want to do Mohs surgery, the very honorable academic thing in dermatology, yeah. or do I really want to do aesthetic medicine, yes. which was totally frowned upon by our peers. Yes. I got the quizzical brow in more than one way. I yes. was ridiculed, frankly. Yes. And then as a last ditch attempt to decide, I decided I'm going to Monaco one last time to the World Congress and I'll, I, I must decide somehow. Yes. And then by some lucky chance, I landed in a session um, where Arthur Swift for the first time presented the seven features of true facial beauty, the Canadian plastic surgeon. And yeah. I thought, oh, here's method, yeah. here is structure. Yeah. And two talks after him, Mauricio de Mayo, for the first time ever presented his eight point lift. And I thought, oh my hat. Yeah, yeah. The lights just went on. Yeah. And I decided I need to um, try and get to these people, but I was too shy to even go and tell Arthur hi. It yeah, was yeah, yeah. I mean, I was too yeah, shy, yeah. so I just didn't. And when I came back, I told Ian, my practice partner, about this. And then two months later, he showed me in the Laser Journal, there was a new book, um, a Stephen Jones filler book. And he told me, here's Arthur Swift. He's this guy you were talking about yeah, with a yeah, chapter yeah. on the mathematics of the perfect cheek. So I ordered the book from Amazon. And um, 
two weeks before the book came, I got a random mail from somebody in Toronto, um, somebody called Noel Solish, who said he wanted to come to our country, but in December, yeah. on the 21st of December, to our clinic, why would he know me, um, to look at the things I did. And I actually thought this person just wanted a letter for tax. Okay. So I told them the clinic is open, Ian, my colleague is here, I'll be in Tatenberg Bay at the sea, but you're welcome. And yeah. it came back and nobody wants to meet me. Okay. So I left it. Um, two weeks later, this book arrives. And in the way that books often just fall open, the way they do, it fell open in chapter three. And here was a chapter on the science of HA fillers written by somebody called Noel Solish. No. But he was a prof in Toronto, and the um, the mail I'd got had no letterhead, and I thought, hmm, he's in the same book as Arthur Swift. Yeah. And I will never forget, I walked out of my office door, yeah. it was August, and told Baiseki, please book me a plane ticket back from George to Cape Town <laughs> for the 20th of December, I'm coming back. Yeah. And I thought I was nuts. Yeah. My husband did too. I mean, he said, how do you know it's the same person? They've got oh, now so the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth in America. Yeah, yeah. But I decided to come back. Yeah. It's a long story, but I got here. And it turns out he is the person in the book. And I told him, well, <clears throat> I, there's somebody in this book called Arthur Swift who I would just so love to be in contact with. And he said, oh, I know him extremely well. Come, come to me um, in Canada, in Toronto, um, first two weeks of August, the weather's the best. Arthur's a good friend of mine. I'll organize you to go to Arthur and you can't come to Canada and not see Kent Remington in Calgary. Mm -hmm. So I went. And the rest, I mean, it's history because Arthur Swift actually came to our country for that September. I invited him to our SASDS Congress and so friendships were forged. And later that year, Mauricio de Mayo, by some fluke, actually um, had to replace another speaker from overseas and de Mayo ended up in our country and he's become one of my um, most precious mentors and friends, actually. So it's how the universe sort of transpired to put me where um, I am. And I think because my path was so exceedingly lonely, other than isolated mentors in other countries, yeah, I've got yeah, a yeah. thing about method and structure and giving yeah, back. Yeah, and yeah. that is actually also why the 10-point plan evolved. Yeah. And in my um, search for things, I met Dario actually in Potosi in um, Singapore, in the Cordova lab. Wow. That's where our friendship started. And that's yeah. actually how our anatomy book, how I came to be invited to the huge privilege of being part of his anatomy book. Yeah. So guys, now I think you realize why uh, Isolde is going to be at World Rhino Plus TV. And actually the anatomy books, yeah. So like for me, so it's so interesting. So you kind of almost stumble into what, because yeah. off air we were speaking about how nearly you decided to go into the Mohs direction, but ended up with this on the aesthetic side. Do you want to tell the guys a little bit more about the book? So those of you who are listening, you are not, are, can't listen, it's watching on YouTube. Yeah. Um, yeah, this well, is a it, book. Tell it, us. Yeah, it's Aesthetic Facial Anatomy, Essentials for Injectors, which was edited by Dario Batossi, Ali Piresh, and myself. Yes. It's now been translated into various languages. And um, it's actually, I find such a beautiful book because the cadaver dissections are superimposed on the most beautiful avatars in this book. So that when, you know, people who aren't so enlightened with cadaver dissections look at it, it's... Um, it's less emotionally scary, shall we say. So it's a book that's in hardcover, also an ebook, and um, we are, will probably be doing um, a second edition sometime soon. So, you know, picking up on this, this uh, avatar thing, so I've had a few discussions with some of the other guys and I've been doing talks on AI and rhinoplasty and facial plastics. I think the next thing we're going to be doing is actually going to physically on the patient be able to overlay what we want to get to. I don't know when it's going to come, but to me, that's quite an exciting new area that I think yeah. is going to take off. So some company is going to hook up to that at a stage and be able to have the tech to be able to, for, I mean, just in rhinoplasty, how much hump you want to reduce, for example, you'll be able to actually superimpose that image on the operating table. Wouldn't that be epic? If they can find a way of identifying vascular structures, mm -hmm. then we've got it made. That's what I'm praying for. Can you imagine? Jeez. Yeah. Okay, so it's all that. Coming from what you've said, this is very interesting for me. How do you manage like three areas of your life of working at CDC, of uh, running your own educational um, training center, and then being an international speaker? So, so maybe for, for because we, I'm trying. It's obviously it's the rhinoplasty podcast. So I think one of the areas we've really not focused on is the skin and the face with rhinoplasty because we like we we must see the the wood not just the tree 
And everyone just focus on this. And that's why we've brought you and Dario in to teach the guys about this. So within kind of thinking about rhinoplasty at the same time, I'm very interested to know how you managed to do those three things together. Um, it's been um, time consuming and all consuming for many years, but I've decided I'm now at a stage in my life where um, I want to differentiate between what is success and what is significant. And for me, it makes me... Um, ridiculously happy to try and share the bit of knowledge I've got. So I've now cut down my clinic days to two days a week. Yeah. And the other three days I'm spending for my international lectures, for publishing and for getting my teaching academies um, content together. And it's giving me huge joy. Wow. Okay. So, so in terms of, uh, I'm, I'm so intrigued with your whole thing about presentations because ultimately World Rhinoplasty Day is about scientific presentations. I mean, we're putting 70 countries head to head to see who is the best. You know? you know, and the, having the editors of the journals as the judges is fantastic. That's amazing. So what would you be saying to somebody who's going to be presenting at World Rhinoplasty? Some tips in terms of presentations. Well, it's, well it's, not just yeah. them. Anybody who wants to present, yeah, what are some of the tips you would It's something think? that makes me so happy because I think that is where the music and art and medicine for me comes together. Okay. So the big thing is to do it in, in a compelling way that um, other people wouldn't think of and to, um, mm -hmm. to try and evoke all the senses. I often think when we as medical students have to present our patients, we say that it's such and such old, this and then gender, mm -hmm. da 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 um, but there's a story behind each and every patient. You can transmit exactly the same knowledge in such a compelling, unforgettable way if you will just tell the story. I've actually just been, um, I've just come back from Monaco from a World Congress where I had to present on um, socially transformative aesthetic medicine, which is basically, you know, other than what toxins do in the brain, what it does in patient lives. And I was using the science um, coupled to patient stories and people in the audience were crying wow. because... So there's such a compelling way. So if you can just try and, and connect, exactly. connect the science with the emotions. Yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, yeah. I personally love adding music to my talks. I, I love the visuals. So there are all kinds of wonderful ways in which you could do that. Okay. So now veering off to the different courses you run. Tell me a bit more about your academy and what well, you offer people. Yeah, well, um, it's called Higher Teaching Academy. Yeah. Um, it actually, I've been using, doing informal training for years, but um. After being in the, in the cadaver lab in Singapore, I was so inspired by the privilege of being inside fresh and that it's just like incredible. Yeah. So it took me about three years to get permission to start dissecting in our, it was actually in the morgue at Tiger Book Hospital with a yeah. wonderful plastic surgery colleague. So we started that and then eventually it evolved to a cadaver dissection course of which we've now done three. The fourth one will be end of this year. Um, so it started with that. So I got the, so we do the cadaver dissection course once a year. I do regular um, toxin hands-on training for f two full full days. Yes. Never more than four to maybe six in a group because it's like really intense yeah, yeah. holding the hands, showing them. There's one on beyond the basics. There's one on injectable skin treatments. Right. Um, the pre presentation skills, which I love, Love. We've recently had a um, full day of uncomplicating fillers, just discussing yeah, yeah. that. And we tomorrow we've got a um, one which a um, wonderful colleague, Dr. Hamza Mustak, is presenting yeah, yeah. A, a periocular masterclass. So I'm just trying to string Testing together it. the things that that for which there's such a need. In Europe, people have exposure to Congress every second month, mm. and here it's difficult, it's yeah, expensive. Yeah. So um, and I've been blessed with so many amazing colleagues in my life who've actually got so much in their hearts to give to our country. So um, it, it makes me happy to be able to um, coordinate those things. No, that's awesome. Mate. Yeah, well. We actually at World Rhinoplasty Week on that Monday, we're going to have a cadaver lab. We've got 24 heads. Amazing. And we should, I mean, that's obviously focused on the anatomy of rhinoplasty stuff, but I think we should look at trying to do something with you maybe around that. Anyway, guys, keep keep listening. We, we'll, we'll do yeah. something there. Um, okay. So let's dial it into a little bit of rhinoplasty and dermatology. So I know you clocked in on one of the um, online meetings a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we, we spoke quite in length about it. And I feel, and I don't think it's really controversial, I think we, we as the surgeons know very little about the skin, actually. Well, like I know very little about rhinoplasty, but we've got so much to, every time I do something collaboratively, I think, yeah. oh my hat, how much we've got to teach. So there are many conditions that really affect the nose other than the appearance and the thickness of nasal skin, which I know is very important yes. to your final. There's a lot to be said about that. So, so in, yeah. I want to interrupt you here. What are for you the key elements in teaching in rhinoplasty and dermatology 
that you think are the important elements and the stuff we're going to be talking about at that session at World Rhinoplasty Day? Well, skin quality to begin with. There's, okay. a, there's a lot of new science that, was, that, that can still be added. Yes, yes. And then the, um, the, the teaching of treating the very, very common conditions, rosacea and acne, yes. which um, can also be covered. And um, there are wonderful new um, scientifically proven topicals and systemics on the market. So there's mm -hmm. a lot one can share there. And I think it might just help you um, to know the state of the art. I mean, we, we've got a fourth generation retinoid wow. now for, for treating acne topically for improving skin texture. So there's, a, um, there's actually a lot which I think our fraternity might try to contribute to the um, extremely um, powerful work that you are doing. Yeah, but I think that's the nice thing. You know, this little world of rhinoplasty, we all like geeks about the nose. But the nice thing is having a Max Fax, ocular plastics, derms, plastics, ENT, all doing the same stuff, we can only get better. And yes. we want to continue improving ourselves on that. Um, okay, I want to veer off a little bit. What have been the difficult things for you? Because you've obviously worked really hard. You've sacrificed a lot to be at the top of your game. But what have been some of the challenges? It's, and, and what I'm kind of veering to is we're in such a male-dominated world within surgery. And there are a number of ladies who listen on this podcast. I want you to encourage those women. We must just do this. I think something that inspired me a lot for the last eight years, I've been part of a group called Flame, yes. Female Leaders in Aesthetic Medicine. There's one in Vancouver, there's one in London, one in Munich, one in um, Switzerland, in Ochitel, and one in... Um, Brazil, one in Melbourne and one here. And it's been incredibly strengthening for us to have um, the group to have each other's backs. These to, seven to, sisters. Literally. And um, wow. we've done publications together just and, and just to have a shared perspective. Just. Because it's incredible. I often think um, in 2021, I think they yeah. visualized the black hole for the first time. Yeah. But there were seven telescopes from different countries which were needed to be able to visualize that black hole. Yes. And I often think if we can have a shared perspective, which you already have, yeah. um, one has just got so much more which you can see and which you can give. So I would, um, I don't think it should be women versus men, but I think we should also have um, opportunities. And if you're good enough, you will get them. Yeah. Okay. And um, off air, we were also talking about how much training you're doing for residents, even though that you, you're you not in an academic institute, as it were. Um, it always reminds me of Rod Rorick when I visited him the first time, and I was just overawed with how busy he was and working and lecturing and publishing. And I said to him, like, he wasn't even in an academic post full time. I said to him, where do you get time for all your academics? And he put his scalpel down and looked at me and says, hey, Cameron, son, academia is a state of mind. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and it's true. It's true. You know, I think what you're doing, I mean, you were saying to me how you had initially thought there might just be seven residents clocking in and you were like 10 times as many. Yeah. Well, firstly, I'm, I'm, I'm an I am an honorary consultant at Stanford University. Yes. But I'm, I'm on the faculty at UCL where there's an MSc in Aesthetic Medicine in London. Oh. And also for the Australasian College of Dermatology, they've got a triennial registrar's program where yeah. they train these people. And um. I've never been successful, we've never been successful in this country of getting that part of the normal registrar training because it's a very full and a very academic course, yeah. which I respect. But I feel they go out into practice and they just don't know how to answer the questions they ask yes. or how to refer, yes. basically. Yes. So um, I decided this year I would love to be part of the difference I'd like to see in this country. Okay. So I've started a residence um, training, a virtual training program, which is you know running over two years by um, by monthly. And I thought the first month we would be the five at Tiger Book Hospital listening, and there were 76 in that call. Wow. Um, two weeks ago, there were 99, and the plastic surgeons are joining in residence, and also the consultants, and as are the ocular plastics. So it's making me so happy, and it gives me such hope for the future and also wow. this country, because it's like young, open minds, which are so special to liaise with. So that really gets me excited. And is it open only to South Africans, or can they, no. are they international? No, they are already. Okay, so how do, you, how do you manage, how do you, do you have to register, or how do you get to be on, on yeah. this, the yeah, if they if they are interested, they need to. I'm doing it free of charge, so there must be some form of structure. So, oh, so, oh, so um, yeah. free of <laughs> yeah. charge. So they must they must fill out a form. We need to know which universities they are, what their previous exposure was, okay. because okay. I try and t try and tailor to their needs. Okay. But they okay. are now from other Africa countries already residents um, listening in, and I mean, 
people are. So how do they? What must they Google or where must they go to be able to get hold of you for this? Well, I can give Daddy. I'll give you the details, and then um, I, if they are part of our mailing list, we can let them know about all our future courses, okay. and ex- especially these. It's also on my Instagram, basically. But okay, and what's your on Instagram it, handle? Just Isolde Heidenreich at Isolde Heidenreich. There and we also go, Hired guys. Teaching Academy. There. So go. Show, make sure this is an opportunity. Like you've got a world leader saying she's going to teach you for free. Sure. Okay. Mm. My second last question, in my absolute ignorance of being an otolaryngologist, in the world of dermatology, what are the areas you can kind of super specialize in? Oh my goodness. You were speaking about like yeah. Mohs surgery, and well, you yourself yeah. were, were the yeah. president of the surgical society within dermatology. Yes. Yeah. But what are some of the other kind of areas? Because like within the ENT, you can be a, like a head and neck surgery, pediatric ENT, uh, otology, rhinology, facial plastics, etc. Where does that fit in, in in derms? What are the different kind of areas? There are many, but not many that are official. So the most is like yeah, yeah. the neurosurgery that's very respected, but there, yeah. there would never be room for so many. But I mean, epic that yeah, people yeah. are doing it in this country. Um, aesthetic dermatology is very tenuously um, delineated. Yeah. and open to a lot of criticism and I'm actually I'm struggling with the field as a whole because aesthetic medicine has now become aesthetics where patients have become clients and I, I struggle a lot with this yes. but one could go in that direction injectables especially um, it's basically you need to train yourself because there's no proper fellowship freely available I don't think Not yet. although there is the MSc at, at UCL but that yeah. doesn't guarantee you practical hand skills yes yes and um, dermatopathology is a very specific thing too the, in, okay. in, in, it, okay. it's a very specific kind of pathology um so um very specialized yeah. um and then um i don't know one just takes own interest and you start doing what you think so i love the um cosmeceuticals yeah. it's one of the the, the um the um topics i do at ucl and because so little is known and because of all the hard sell, I've actually last year started with a cosmeceuticals boot camp via Hyatt Academy where we had a full day here and in Johannesburg just um, on cosmeceuticals, just to understand how you make sense of this rapidly um, expanding group of um, cosmeceuticals, mm, which, is, mm. which is so much hard sell. So there are many um, different divisions. Most of them are softly delineated. Yeah. Okay, there are two more things I wanted to chat about. So the, lo- the second last one is a little bit more kind of on the controversial side. And then the last one I'll ask you is kind of it's, it's, it's odd to think that how many decades you have studied for to get to where you're at. And yet someone can open a shop next to you and say, aesthetic medicine, come to me. I don't know. I think sometimes the specialists have spent too much time studying and worrying about becoming absolutely brilliant and this realizing whew, they might be overtaken by so-called estheticians. And I think you, we at obviously see a huge amount of complications that come from that. Mm. So what would your message be to potential clients, patients who are listening to this in terms of where you should go for your treatment? Well, this is interesting because there's something called the Dunning-Kruger curve, which Dunning and Kruger got the Nobel Prize for in 2000. In the curve, I'll have to draw it back to front for the camera, but it sort of runs like this. And this axis is confidence. Yes. And that axis is competence. Yes. So this whole curve is to demonstrate unskilled and unaware of it. Yes. And that peak, they called Mount Stupid. So it's a group of people who are very confident, yeah, yeah, yeah. but don't really know what they're doing. The expert is right down here, low down on the curve, because they realize what can go wrong. So that is a big thing. Um, and sadly, um, the only thing patients have to decide by is the confidence with which somebody comes across. But this is interesting because patient mindset interests me. So um, last year, um, Cora McDonald in Australia and I published three um, publications on patient mindset um, and the one was just general patient mindset we looked at about 1500 patients over various confidence con- um, continents we're extending it now to the japan asia region and um, i want you to understand what is important to patients so interestingly across all the different generations from gen z's to boomers trust was important mm-hmm. and the things that made patients go to a specific practitioner was firstly his um, qualifications, secondly word of mouth, reputation, the last little column right there, tiny tiny on this bar graph was social media. 
So everybody is trying to punch themselves very um, strongly on social media. Yeah, yeah. But what drives patients is basically trust and word of mouth, the discrete things, the things which basically form what we call functional quality, not yeah, even yeah. technical quality. So that um, I found interesting. Um, I work often in the East. So um, we are now extending this study to the Japan, Asia, yeah, yeah. China region. Um, I think it might look different there because they are very, very socially media yes, different. Yes, yes. But in, in, in basically Australia, Africa, North and South America, Europe, where we did our trial, um, um, social media was a very small part of it. So um, I think probably word of mouth and qualifications would be a good way of, of presenting yourself. But, but um, my heart shrinks often when I see problems from outside and realize that practitioners have been marketed with just confidence. Things go wrong. They very Aunt confidently do the, the second wrong thing and then the third wrong thing and the patient is believing them. And by the time they get to us, um, things have gone irretrievably wrong. So just for the patients, just look at the qualifications and make sure that you have word of mouth. And for the injectables, please make sure that the person you are going to and the practice they come from has the kind of look that you would want. Mm. Because there's a thing called perception drift, whereby pa patients present with one small problem, it gets rectified, and then the baseline changes. They want the second thing, and the baseline yeah, changes. Exactly. And it, these clones of totally abnormal, unnatural patients are um, basically created. And sadly, perception drift is not just amongst the patients. It is also amongst physicians. And actually, we had a full session now at Monaco. Um, the symposium was called The Art of Subtle. And tellingly, there was a lecture on um, filler bulimia, full, empty, refill. And the fact that such lectures are actually now necessary in our society, um, it, it saddens me. So that you actually answered the last question there. How do you stop that? That's the thing, is where do you draw the line to say enough's enough? Look, you are a beautiful person, but I want to just change a little bit, a little bit yeah. more, a little bit more. That's so hard to nail that down. Yeah. And the thing is, um, I don't think... Any surgeon or practitioner has the right to superimpose on a patient what their idea of beauty is. Yeah. So firstly, you've got to have a really open-minded discussion and be very sure that you're unbiased. And we actually all are. There are new studies showing that um, all people have a total lack of insight into their own inaccuracies, in their own bias. So one is like quite sure. And I do think we need um, intercollegial discussions too. If, if, um, it's difficult to think you've got, a pa you've got a colleague who is creating overfilled faces. There's the, what they call the FOS face, facial overfill syndrome. You see it happening. Mm, mm, mm. You know it's doing it. But I mean, to think of going to that kind of person and telling them you're overfilling, it, yeah. it's difficult. So the only thing we can do is to discuss. One of my favorite um, talks of all time, and I think probably will end here, was for Australia last year. I was invited to speak and I was asked to speak about the challenge of accepting we aren't as good as we think we are. And I love that. So um, I told them I'm going to do this in three parts um, and I would like to poll. So we all know that you're accepted what you do, but the first part was patient communication. Second part was safety. And the third part was um, our understanding of and creation of beauty. So I told the audience, it was a huge audience, um, not for you, but on behalf of our global fraternity. Out of 10, what do you give our safety as a global fraternity? Mm -hmm. What do you give our communication skills as a fraternity? What do you give our creation of beauty as a fraternity, and not one of those three polled more than five out of ten. Wow. So this huge group basically identified a 50% deficit. Um, I actually, I was asked to write an opinion piece on that, which is being published any day now. So um, I think the more we discuss these things, uh, um, hopefully the more open-minded we can become, and maybe there can be some other forum where we can gently ask each other whether we, there should be a standard to hold to. But there's enormous pushback against overfilled faces, which yeah. makes me happy. You know, Isolde, this, this is now the end of four years of recording podcasts. And this whole season, I've been thinking, when's my knockout punch going to come? And today was the knockout punch. It is oh. so interesting to chat to you. Uh, really, I've been hanging off every word you say. Oh saying. my goodness, it's, it's Kevin. And it's just, no, it's inspiring. It's great to see that right here in South Africa, we've got somebody who's changing the world, eh? I don't know, but if we just all do our little bit, yeah. then the world can change. Yeah. So, guys, listen, I just want to give a shout out to 
everyone who's listened to this podcast, to all the people who've been interviewed on the podcast. It's just absolutely fantastic. And I, I just hope that there's one thing you get out of here is be inspired to be the best person you can be and uh, go and change the world. So, Zolda, thank you so much. I really appreciate um, your time. Well, kudos to you, Cameron, and what you are doing. I salute you. For those of you who are only listening to this on a podcast platform, please try and reach out and get onto YouTube because on our YouTube channel, we've got some really cool clips where I interview the guests.